My name is Elizabeth Hind, and today I'm going to talk about uh, using fluorescence to observe DNA in a living cell. Um, and I'm from the School of Physics in the Faculty of Science at the University of Melbourne, and um, this presentation is part of the National Science Week. So just to outline the lecture, um, I was going to first tell you a little bit about DNA and how it's organized inside the nucleus of your cell. So all your DNA and its three dimensional conformation inside the nucleus is what we call uh, your genome. Um, and then I was going to talk about how we can image DNA in a living cell by decorating it with fluorescent uh, molecules. And this enables us to observe detail below what is called the diffraction limit. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly about how we do that and how a series of methods that have what we call super resolution are really allowing us now to see DNA inside a living cell and understand how it regulates um, your genome functions. Okay, so to start with, I'll give you a background on how DNA is organized in your cell. So as you all probably know, uh, DNA is the molecule that encodes the blueprint of life. Um, and inside a human, there are around 37 trillion cells. And inside the nucleus of each of those cells, there's approximately two meters of DNA folded into a three-dimensional network. And this represents our genome. So the, the nucleus is around 10 microns in diameter, and you have two meters worth of DNA folded into this tiny microscopic volume. Um, and this DNA network, it contains all the genetic instructions to build and maintain an organism. So the question is, how do you package this amount of DNA into such a small volume? So the way that the DNA is packaged is important because it needs to be accessed by the, the proteins that read and copy your genetic information. So the DNA template is first wrapped around these little proteins called histones. Um, and the DNA wrapped around these little proteins um, forms a subunit that we call a nucleosome. And it forms um, these little bead-like structures along this string, which is the DNA. So you have these nucleosomes spaced every so often. They're about 11 nanometers in diameter. Um, and then this bead on a string configuration is folded in on itself into these chromatin fibers that are about 30 nanometers in diameter. And then this is further folded onto itself into this multi-layered um, structure that finally becomes a, a chromosome territory inside your nucleus. Um, and somehow uh, all the proteins that need to, to read this genetic information know how to navigate this three-dimensional structure. So you have a huge amount of DNA packaged into a very small volume. Um, and initially we thought that the genome size would predict organism complexity. So it would make sense that humans would have so much DNA. Um, and it's true that the genomes of eukaryotes are in general larger than prokaryotes. Um, but amongst eukaryotes, there's actually a remarkable lack of correspondence between genome size and organism complexity. So you can see here, if you compare prokaryotes like bacteria uh, with eukaryotes like uh, mammals, insects, plants, algae, there's definitely uh, a larger genome size associated with eukaryotes versus these prokaryotes. But you can see amongst the eukaryotes that there's not a lot of um, correlation between organism complexity and the genome size. So you can see like a lot of protists actually have genome sizes much larger than multicellular organisms like mammals. So for example, if we were to compare the genome size of a human, uh, which is about 3 um, billion uh, base pairs, it's pretty much equivalent to a cane toad, which is quite surprising because you might think we're much more complex than a cane toad. But maybe even more surprising is you have the axolotl, it has um, around 10 times as much DNA as our genome. And maybe even more surprising is this uh, plant from Japan called a Paris japonica, and it has 47 times the amount of DNA that is contained in our genome. So you can see that genome size doesn't necessarily predict um, organism complexity. So genome size um, doesn't predict it, but maybe uh, gene count does. So the amount of DNA that's actually meaningful within the genome, maybe this is what's predicting um, organism complexity. 
But actually, in addition to the amount of total genomic DNA varying widely between eukaryotes, the proportion of coding DNA, so the amount of DNA that uh, codes for proteins versus non-coding DNA that doesn't code for proteins within these genomes actually varies a lot as well. So, um, for example, if we take um, the amount of DNA in the genome and use whole, whole genome sequencing, what's been found from the Human Genome Project is that actually um, the number of genes within the human genome is on around 22,300 genes. And this is much less than what was expected. They thought at least there would be like 30 to 100,000 genes. Um, and it's actually comparable to many other mammals. But what it does suggest is that 98% of our genome is actually made up of non-coding DNA. And, and that begs the question, then what is that 98% of our genome doing? So for example, if we again compare the human and the axolotl, um, you can see here the genome size versus the gene count. So we still have the same number of genes as the axolotl. But if you look at the Drosophila that has a much uh, smaller genome size, Again, the gene count is comparable, and this is also true for C. elegans. So there's this lack of correspondence in genome size, um, but there's this special number of genes that's um, needed uh, for higher um, organisms. Um, but the question also remains then, if we only have this many genes and this different size in genome size, what is all this extra DNA coding for? Or not, well, it's kind of non-coding, but what is it actually serving a purpose for? So what is the function of all the, the non-coding um, DNA? Um, the, uh, sorry, so we know that the human genome, um, single DNA sequence, it encodes around 200 different cell types of distinct functions that are um, each defined by expression of a subset of genes. So you can see here in the human cell, uh, in the human body, we have um, neurons versus muscle cells versus immune cells shown here, and they all have a completely different morphology. Um, and they all stem from a single DNA sequence. And so the question is, how does a single DNA sequence give rise to these um, many different cell types of such different morphology and different function? And what we know now is that the, the genome undergoes um, significant spatial and temporal rearrangements that essentially compact different parts of the genome down so that they're inaccessible to the proteins that read or copy um, the genetic information. And so this really determines what genes are ultimately expressed. And so these 2% of genes that are coding for proteins can be modulated, they can be turned on or off or um, enhanced or repressed. And it's thought that you have all this DNA that's undergoing spatial rearrangements that allow different parts of the genome to become accessible to the proteins that read and copy genetic information. And this is how you get these um, 200 different cell types from a single DNA sequence. And so there's increasing information suggesting that um, while 2% of the genome is actually coding for protein, the other 98% is responsible for these spatial and temporary arrangements um, that are controlling gene expression. So with the whole genome sequencing of over 180 organisms complete, um, we now need to look beyond DNA sequence and begin to understand how genomes are organized in a, in a living cell. So we know from genome sequencing um, that there's this 2% that codes for proteins, but how can we look into what this other 98% is doing and how it's regulating that 2% of coding DNA? So as I mentioned at the start, the, the DNA template or the DNA sequence that underpins our genome is not just a linear sequence. It's packaged around these nucleosomes that are folded into these chromatin fibers that occupy uh, chromosome territories uh, within the cell nucleus. And so the tool of choice to, to study how the DNA template is arranged um, in three-dimensional space is, is optical microscopy because it enables us to see how the DNA is organized in space, but it's also compatible with live cells. And so we can watch quite dynamic rearrangements in um, DNA network structure as a function of time. As you can see here, we have a cell undergoing division and you have the mitotic chromosome um, pulling apart as it undergoes um, mitosis. So, Optical microscopy is the tool of choice, and it's, it's what's going to enable us to look beyond the DNA uh, sequence. But the problem is that DNA is really, really small, 
Um, and optical microscopy, there's a limit to what you can observe. So this brings us to the next part of the talk where we need to discuss the limitations of optical microscopy and a phenomenon known as diffraction. So optical microscopy has undoubtedly revolutionized our understanding of cell biology. However, as a result of the wave-like nature of light, a phenomenon known as diffraction actually limits what spatial detail we can resolve. So if we place a very small biological specimen um, in front of an objective lens, and we produce an image of this very small object by magnifying it, we can get um, an observation of more of the small amount of detail within that biological specimen. For example, in 1676, um, Leeuwenhoek uh, used a single uh, spherical lens to magnify um, the first observation of uh, bacteria from um, plaque on the teeth. Um, and so this enables you to magnify an image and you can even go one step further and get another spherical lens and magnify this image into a larger image of a hundred times fold and resolve more spatial detail within your biological specimen as Robert Hooke did, and he was the person that actually coined the term use of um, the cell in cork. But at a certain point, it doesn't matter how many times you magnify an image, you get to a limit and you can't resolve any more spatial detail within your sample. So while we can keep magnifying our image, a phenomenon known as diffraction um, limits what we can observe because the, the light that is focused by the spherical lens it doesn't actually converge into a single point like I've shown here in this ray diagram. It actually forms this blurry little focal spot and it has a finite size due to the phenomenon known as diffraction. And so you can see if we don't have a um, focal point but more of these blurry focal spots, then at a certain point we can't start, uh, resolve two adjacent points within our specimen. And Ernst Abbey um, defined this limit in 1873, and it depends on the numerical aperture of your objective and the wavelength of light that you use to observe your sample. But essentially on an optical microscope, you can resolve detail in a sample down to about 250 nanometers. So adjacent points below 250 nanometers cannot be resolved by lens-based optical microscopy and essentially what maybe looked like um, a little bacterium here, you would expect that you could observe this if you keep magnifying your specimen, um, the object. Actually, you start to lose information the more you try to magnify this image. And this is exactly what happens when we try to look at DNA, because as I went through uh, the layers of structure that underpin our genome before, um, you're looking at things that are around 2 to 50 nanometers um, with an observation volume that is limited to 250 nanometers. So what aspects of genome architecture can we see? Uh, well, in a living cell, we can see DNA density, that's for sure, but we, we don't have enough resolution to see how that DNA is spatially arranged. And we certainly don't have enough um, spatial or temporal resolution to see how it regulates gene expression. So here we have um, like all the different scales of what you can see with the human eye. As you can see with the human eye, you can see down to around 100 microns. And the light microscope gets us down to around 250 nanometers. So we can see eukaryotic cells. Uh, we can see bacteria. Here we have the coronavirus. You can see that that's actually getting to a point that light microscopy wouldn't be able to see. So we could turn to electron microscopy, which can get us down to um, the size of a virus or a small molecule. Here we have an atom. But you can see the light microscopy doesn't allow us to see um, these objects. So in terms of chromatin structure, we can see the nucleus. We can see chromosome territories. We can see uh, DNA density, but we certainly can't see the DNA template wrapped around these um, histone structures, the nucleosomes. Um, and we know that this is the structure we want to see if we to understand how gene regulation is expressed by the non-coding portion of our genome. So here you can see an electron microscopy image of this beads on a string-like structure. You have the nucleosome here connected by the DNA. And you might ask, well, why not just use electron microscopy then if it, if it enables us to observe down to these very small spatial scales? But of course, the problem with electron microscopy is that the sample must be fixed. And so all the dynamics that are responsible for genes being turned on and off and how the proteins that read 
um, the genome interact with the DNA templates um, cannot be observed in a fixed sample. We need to be able to track the rearrangements in DNA as they occur in real time. And ideally, we want to be able to also tag the proteins that are reading this information and how they interact with the structural framework. So a massive breakthrough occurred where there was a collaboration between physics, chemistry and biology. And after centuries of gradual improvement in the resolving power of optical microscopes, a series of new and exciting far field methods emerged that essentially break this unbreakable rule of diffraction. So you might have heard about a phenomenon known as uh, fluorescence. It's where you have a, a molecule or a fluorophore, as we call it, that has the capacity to absorb light of, of some wavelength, for example, a blue wavelength. Um, and this leads to excitation of, a, of an electron to a higher excitation level. And as that um, electron uh, relaxes to the ground state of the first excited or the ground level of the first excited state, you'll see emission of light at some other wavelength. So for example, if blue light's absorbed or green light's absorbed, you might see red fluorescence. Um, and this is what is known as fluorescence. And essentially uh, at a certain point in 1962, um, there was a group of scientists that extracted a protein from a jellyfish and found that it exhibited a green fluorescent uh, green fluorescence. And so this green fluorescent protein really revolutionized our capacity to look at cell biology, particularly if we couple it with an optical microscope, uh, because it means that we can actually now label um, biological molecules, specific biological molecules with a green fluorescent protein and localize where they are in a living cell. So these molecular probes coupled with optical microscopy now allow us to observe nuclear structure specifically. We can label different parts of the genome, although we're still observing it with diffraction limited uh, optical microscopy. Um, but what's, what's nice about this advance is that with novel label strategies, we can actually get down to nanometer detail using um, various novel optical schemes that I'll, I'll talk about. So it's really coupling um, optical microscopy with these new molecular probes that were generated um, first in 1962, but have really advanced um, up to 2000. There's a whole palette of green fluorescent proteins. Um, that if there's blue fluorescent proteins, red fluorescent proteins, and we can specifically label different chromosome territories uh, within a nucleus. So, there's this advent of super resolution that I've been talking about, but how do we actually get around the diffraction limit? So I've mentioned that there was this big breakthrough where um, genetically encoded fluorescent proteins were discovered from um, extraction from a jellyfish, and they enable us to label biological molecules of interest. And these fluorescent proteins coupled with optical microscopy, which enables us to excite these fluorescent proteins and then detect their fluorescence, is what enabled us to really get around the diffraction limit and start to observe genome architecture in its entirety. So just to give you an idea of um, what was possible before the advent of um, the fluorescent proteins and super resolution microscopy, here you can see quite amazingly that in 1882, um, just using optical microscope, like a standard compound microscope, um, drawings of the mitotic structures during cell division were actually pretty accurate. So you could see the interface nucleus, the chromatin fiber um, being organized in the, in the cell nucleus. And then here you have the mitotic spindle and just before cell division when there's two interphase nuclei formed. But then it became quickly realized that although this was definitely responsible for the genetic information in the cell, we couldn't really see everything. And then there was electron microscopy that offers much higher resolution, as we saw before, but in a fixed cell. And this enabled us to see the nucleosomes on the beads on a string along the DNA. And then, of course, there was also this famous X-ray photo of the double helix structure. So we knew that at this point that DNA was indeed the molecule responsible for our genetic information, although we've never actually seen it um, inside the cell. We had seen these nucleosome structures um, and the beads along the string, but we didn't know yet um, how DNA was actually organized. And then in the 1990s, um, a number of novel optical microscope setups appeared that enabled sectioning um, of the nucleus. So you could do 3D sectioning throughout the nucleus using a confocal microscope or using something called two photon excitation. 
And it was about this time that these GFP uh, or fluorescent proteins um, were discovered. So the confocal microscope, um, here we have a picture of one, is basically a microscope that has lasers um, that of wavelength that can excite these different fluorescent proteins that are available. And it also has detectors that can detect the emission from these different fluorescent proteins. And so this technology, the confocal microscope, or the two photon excitation coupled with these green fluorescent proteins meant that we no longer just had to look at a, a phase contrast image of the cell um, using optical microscope. We could actually specifically label the DNA network, for example, here with a blue fluorescent protein. You can see regions of very high compact DNA density versus more open areas in the nucleoplasm. And we could even also label proteins that interact with the DNA network with a different color. For example, a green fluorescent protein. And so here you can see one of the proteins that reads and copies um, the DNA is labeled in green and the, the DNA is labeled in blue. So this started to really give us the specificity to be able to look at how the nucleus organized, albeit with diffraction limited resolution. But as I'm going to now describe in the, in, in the last uh, week or so, we've been able to get around the diffraction limit and look at the nucleus using super resolution, still using these fluorophores, but as you can see here, now we're starting to obtain images of the nucleosomes, the beads along the string that are comparable to the electron microscopy images. So I keep talking about the fact that we can get around this diffraction limit by coupling fluorescence with optical microscopy. So how do we actually do this? Well, there are several different innovative approaches um, and they're all underpinned by taking advantage of the novel fluorophore photophysics and coupling them with um, optical schemes that are, um, enable like patterned excitation or temporal excitation. And I'll talk about um, this in more detail now. So here we have the, the palettes of fluorescent dyes and fluorescent proteins that will enable us to really label um, the DNA network and proteins that interact it, with it with different colors. So fluorescence um, is characterized by um, an excitation spectrum and something we call an emission spectrum. So this excitation spectrum tells us the wavelengths of light that can excite fluorescent protein. And this tells us the wavelengths of light that it emits at. So if we know this information, we can specifically excite a protein of interest. And we also can detect that protein of interest. And we can also do it for many different colors if we label multiple components of our sample. But in, in addition to these different um, fluorescent colored proteins that we can paint um, different parts of the cell with, there's these even more exciting fluorescent proteins um, that are photoactivatable. So there's ones that are dark, and then if you expose them to a certain wavelength of light, they'll become fluorescent. There's photoconvertible ones, so they can start off as blue, and then we expose them to a certain wavelength and we switch them to green. There's also something called photo switchable, where um, this is a permanent photo conversion, but we can actually switch them between two colors. So we can make them red and then switch them back to green. And there's also a phenomenon known as fluorescence, uh, first resonance energy transfer that I'll talk about a bit more today. And this is a really neat effect where if a green fluorescent protein is near another fluorescent protein, and the emission of this fluorescent protein, so that would be the emission spectrum, overlaps with where this protein absorbs, there'll be a transfer of energy and then you'll only see the emission of the second fluorophore. And the reason this effect is really cool is that um, the transfer of energy only takes place when they're in very close proximity. So this is a way we can start to look at things on a spatial scale below the diffraction limit. So in terms of super resolution, um, I mentioned that there's like different ways we can do it. You can either use structured illumination, you can use um, special excitation volumes that lead to a smaller observation volume. So if I have my sample labeled with a specific fluorescent protein and I excite it with one laser that excites it and another laser that depletes um, the signal at the perimeter, then I get a smaller observation volume than that diffraction limited observation volume I was talking about before, that's actually 50 nanometers wide. So you can see in the image that is diffraction limited, it's hard to see what these structures are. But when I use this depletion of the fluorescence at the perimeter, you can start to see that these um, nuclear pore complexes that surround the nucleoplasm and regulate transport in and out of the nucleus are resolved. 
Another really cool way to use fluorescence uh, with optical microscopy to get around the diffraction limit is to use something called single molecule localization microscopy. So in this method, you use these photoactivatable proteins that I mentioned. So they go from a dark state to some bright state. And the, the nice thing about this sort of um, fluorescent protein is that you can control how many molecules are actually bright at any moment in time. And if you don't have many molecules in your sample, then it doesn't matter how big your observation volume is from your objective of your, of your microscope, you can just see one spot. And so you could fit this to a Gaussian function and find the center of this spot and in some way um, locate where it is with super resolution. So the idea is if you only turn on a couple of molecules in your image at any one point in time, like a blinking movie, you get this temporal separation. You can fit each of these points to a Gaussian and clearly define where each feature is in your image, although it looks blurred when you look at the diffraction limited spots if you turn them on one by one, you can actually locate the center of them. And in terms of the nucleus, you can go from an image that looks more like this to a super resolved image that looks like this. So as you can see, coupling fluorescence with optical microscopy, it's really revolutionized what we can see in the nucleus. And these three researchers actually received the Nobel Prize for this in 2014. Um, there are other cool things you can do. You can couple this sort of approach to super resolution with um, very novel sample preparations. For example, there's something called expansion microscopy where you literally expand the sample like the nucleus into a larger sample um, by stretching it out on this um, tethered membrane. And then you apply the super resolution microscopy to your sample that has actually physically been expanded. And so <clears throat> here you can see again, those nuclear pore complex structures on a nanometer scale. So what does this mean for genome architecture? Well, the spatial resolution of light microscopy is essentially now approaching the nanoscale. And so before we could just see chromatin structure at the level of DNA density, but now we can really start to look at it at the level of nucleosome proximity and how is the DNA arrangement in the cell nucleus actually regulating genome function. So if we go back to this diagram here, where we saw what a human eye or a light microscope can observe with respect to chromatin structure, you can see that this is all above the diffraction limit, but with the methods I've just mentioned, um, the structured illumination, we can get down to 100 nanometers. With the STED microscope that had the donut shaped beam that depletes the signal at the perimeter, we can get down to 50 nanometers. And with single molecule localization microscopy, we can start to see these beads on a string structure and look at these nucleosome uh, clutches on a scale of five to 50 nanometers. And this is really comparable to electron microscopy. But the problem is, of course, as you get down to uh, higher and higher resolution, these methods have very poor temporal resolution. And so we still can't see these dynamic rearrangements in the DNA network that are regulating the proteins that read the information and lead to the different genes being expressed. And we really also can't see the DNA template itself um, on a very fast time scale um, rearranging in response to these rearrangements in non-coding DNA. And so this is where I wanna tell you about a final approach to observing genome structure that we're using in our lab that enables you to look at uh, rearrangements in DNA structure that regulate gene expression and is approaching um, a spatial and temporal resolution that's finally enabling us to see how non-coding DNA um, induces rearrangements in genome architecture that lead to um, regulation of gene expression so that 2% of DNA that actually codes for proteins. So to probe real-time nanoscale rearrangements in um, live cell genome organization in our lab, we make use of that phenomenon that I briefly mentioned called first to resonance energy transfer or FRET for short. And it really serves as like a molecular ruler for live cell architecture. So if we go back to the, the fluorophores that we have to play with, we, we have a whole palette. Um, and in the case of FRET, what you need is a donor molecule and an acceptor molecule. So if we have our green fluorescent protein and we know that it's excited with this blue wavelength and it emits at a green wavelength, and we want to set up a FRET experiment, we need to choose a second protein that's going to absorb the emission of our donor molecule. And so a red fluorescent protein is an appropriate choice 
because uh, the absorption is going to match the energy required to excite our acceptor fluorophore. And only when these two fluorophores are really close together will there be a transfer of energy from the green fluorophore that will enhance the fluorescence of the acceptor molecule, our red fluorophore. And so you can see here the absorption of the acceptor fluorophore overlaps with the emission of our donor fluorophore, and this leads to the red fluorescence. So this is a neat uh, phenomenon because it only occurs on a spatial scale of one to 10 nanometers. So you can imagine if we have our, our nuclear structure and we have these nucleosomes um, and they're organized in a way that regulates the proteins that read the genetic information for a specific part of the DNA template. If we were to somehow label this in a way where we could only measure protein interaction on a scale of one to 10 nanometers, then we'd be able to look at how these nucleosomes are packaged together and how dense is the DNA structure on a super result of 10 nanometers. So for example, if we were to label the DNA network with a green fluorescent protein, but also a red fluorescent protein, then only when the green fluorescent protein is within one to 10 nanometers of a red fluorescent protein, would I see this phenomenon called FRET. And I know exactly how close these proteins are to each other based on what is called the efficiency of FRET. And so this molecular ruler can start to tell us about how DNA is organized on a scale of one to 10 nanometers, just by mapping in each pixel of a nucleus that is labeled with green and red fluorescent proteins, how much FRET is at each location. So just to go over how, uh, threat between fluorescently labeled DNA network can tell us about uh, the DNA organization on a super resolved scale. Here we have a human cell labeled uh, with a green fluorescent protein, the DNA network, and it's also labeled with a red fluorescent protein. So if there was loose chromatin, you would expect there to be not much threat because the green and red proteins wouldn't be that close to each other on a scale of one to 10 nanometers. But if the chromatin was really compact in some regions, you would expect these two molecules on average to be closer together. And so you would see a lot of FRET. So we're looking for this event that only occurs on a scale of one to 10 nanometers. So in our cell that is expressing the green and red fluorescent proteins that decorate our DNA network, we can detect FRET by a method called fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy. And this method essentially detects FRET by um, analyzing the excited state lifetime of the donor molecule. So if we have here a human cell, this is the regular DNA network organized throughout the nucleoplasm, and we treat it with a drug that opens up the DNA network, or we treat it with a drug that compacts the DNA network. It's hard to tell from these fluorescence intensity images if they look more open or compact than the wild type case. But in each of these cells, the red fluorescent protein is also present. And if we map how much FRET there is throughout this nucleoplasm, what we find is that if we color the pixels where there's high fret in red and the pixels where there's no fret in teal, you can see that in a, in a normal human cell, the nuclear envelope is quite compact because you have red pixels. There's some compaction throughout the nucleoplasm and there's also some open chromatin throughout. But when we treat the cell with a drug that opens up the DNA network, you lose your fret signal entirely. So that means the chromatin has opened up and the nucleosomes are now more than 10 nanometers apart. And if we compact the chromatin network with a drug that um, brings all those nucleosomes close together, you can see from the red pixels that there is FRET throughout. And so the interesting thing is that when you look at a diffraction limited image of the nucleus, they all look pretty similar. And it's only when you look on a scale of one to 10 nanometers at the proximity of these nucleosomes with respect to each other, inside this diffraction limited observation volume, that you realize these three nuclear architectures are entirely different and they're organized on a completely different scale um, of one to 10 nanometers. So we wanted to use this assay to look at how maybe genome organization is regulating genome function. So we decided to look at a really important problem and that is how does chromatin architecture or the three-dimensional organization of your DNA network regulate uh, maintenance of genome integrity? So what does this mean? Well, at any moment in time, your genome is susceptible to what's called a DNA double strand break. And this is like the most dangerous type of DNA damage that can occur. But luckily we have this cellular surveillance system uh, that 
can recognise when a double strand break has occurred and recruit DNA repair machinery to that site of damage immediately uh, to fix the damage um, before it's too late. So an outstanding question is though, you can see how complicated it is. You have two metres of DNA packaged into this 10 micron volume. And the question is, how does the nucleus recognise where the double strand break has occurred and recruit repair machinery to that site so quickly? And there's increasing evidence from biochemical assays that somehow this nuclear architecture here that is regulated by the non-coding part of your genome is facilitating repair factor arrival to a sense double strand break site. So we wanted to look using that histone thread assay how maybe this DNA network is rearranging to facilitate repair factor recruitment to a detected double strand break site. And so we use this histone threat assay. But of course, first we needed to figure out a way to induce a DNA double strand break in a living cell. And to do that, we used um, a specific type of laser exposure that recruits repair machinery um, to a double strand break site. So here you can see a human cell expressing a repair factor that's tagged to GFP. And we trialed many different conditions. We cut the DNA network essentially with a laser and when we found a condition that recruits this repair factor, we know that we've, recruited, we've induced a double strand break at that location. So here we have another human cell that's expressing um, our histone tagged to GFP that labels the DNA network green. And also in this cell is our DNA network labeled with a histone tag to M cherry, that's a red fluorescent protein. So we're able to detect FRET throughout this nucleoplasm. We then induce a double strand break inside this white dash square and we follow the cell's recovery over the course of six hours. So it takes about six hours for the DNA damage response to completely repair that double stem break. So here we have the chromatin network labeled with the green fluorescent protein and the red fluorescent protein is present, we just haven't shown it here. But if we pseudo color this according to FRET, our nanoscale readout of chromatin organization, what we find is that at the double strand break site, you have this chromatin compaction that occurs and then it propagates out from the double strand break site as a function of time, leaving the double strand break open. And if we zoom in on this region of interest, so here's where the double strand break is induced, you can see at zero minutes, it's very compact. And then by 30 minutes, it opens up and it's actually the perimeter of the double strand break site that is compact. So what this tells us is that there are spatial rearrangements in the DNA network that follow double strand break induction. The double strand break site first compacts and then it opens up and the perimeter compacts. And we wanted to know why would the genome organize this and does it have a biological function? And what we found from a series of genetic experiments that knock down different enzymes in the double strand break pathway is that this rearrangement in the chromatin architecture actually facilitates efficient recruitment of repair factors to a double strand break site. So here you have a key double strand break repair factor tagged to green fluorescent protein. And if we induce a double strand break in much the same way as we did in this experiment, you can see that it's recruited to the double strand break site. And if we zoom in on the region of interest, you can see that at zero minutes, there's not much recruitment, but by 30 to 60 minutes, there's maximal recruitment. And what we find is that the opening of the chromatin is what enables accumulation of the repair factor at the double strand break site. And this border of chromatin compaction actually facilitates efficient accumulation only at the double strand break site and limits interaction with surrounding chromatin that is intact. So this is an example of how looking at DNA organization in three dimensional space in the context of a living cell is important because of while the, the DNA sequence that underpins this rearrangement in genome architecture might not make sense to a genome sequencing experiment, it clearly serves a purpose in facilitating um, DNA repair factor uh, navigation of the nuclear landscape and maintenance of genome integrity. So just to uh, summarize, uh, today I have told you about genome organization and I think you can see that it's pretty amazing that we have two meters of DNA packaged into these microscopic volumes, the nucleus of every single cell, and that it's packaged in a meaningful way that can be used um, by the proteins that read and copy the information, but also navigated by the proteins that maintain genome integrity. And so while 2% of our DNA may be coding for, coding for proteins that maintain um, and build organisms, the other 98% 
appears to be doing also critical functions, um, namely reorganizing the genome such that it can be used by the proteins that read and copy information. So we need to look beyond the DNA template and start to look at the DNA, how it's organized in space and time. So you can see during cell division, it undergoes massive reorganization. And as I mentioned, the tool of choice is optical microscopy because it's non-invasive and compatible with live cells. But of course, the problem is that DNA is really, really small and um, diffraction limits what we can observe in a living cell. We can see down to around 250 nanometers, um, and this is a much larger volume than the DNA template. So while electron microscopy has for a long time given us a really important insight how the DNA is organized in the cell, it gives us a real fixed snapshot of the DNA network that isn't dynamic or reflecting what the non-coding part of our genome is orchestrating. So we need ways to get around the diffraction limit and observe how the DNA reorganizes and interacts with the proteins that regulate gene expression. And we saw that there are different uh, innovative ways we can do that, that take advantage of the advent of the genetically encoded fluorescent proteins. For example, single molecule localization microscopy, where you turn proteins on one at a time and build an image up using the center of each diffraction limited spot to localize that uh, feature of your biological sample with more or less infinite resolution. And so here you can see the nucleosome clutches that were only accessible by electron microscopy in the past. Or you can use this histone thread assay that we're using, which gives you a super resolved readout of how your DNA is organized, but in a diffraction limited pixel. But the advantage is that it's dynamic and you can see how your chromatin network responds to different pharmacological agents. Um, you can see how it rearranges during gene expression or DNA repair. And so this is a really useful tool that we're using to try to understand how genomes actually work in their natural environment, um, the nucleus of a living cell. So with that, I would just like to thank you for your attention. Um, here's my email if you have any more questions. Um, and this is the group uh, I work with in the School of Physics who are doing all this research. And um, I hope you enjoy National Science Week. Thanks, Liz. We're happy to take questions in the Q&A function. There's, um, does the DNA double strand break have to be in the coding region of the DNA or does this DNA repair also work in the non-coding region of the DNA? Um, so that's a really great question actually um, and it's not entirely known but what is known is that um, depending on how your DNA is arranged, uh, so DNA that's um, usually coding for proteins and needs to be transcribed is in a more open state, so the transcription factors can get in there and read the, the genetic template. And certainly the DNA repair pathways, there's many, um, and they do. it does depend on the chromatin state. So if the chromatin is closed and compacted, that can regulate the kinetics of repair and the double strand break repair pathway. And for double strand breaks, there's two choices. Um, there's one that's really fast but inaccurate, and there's one that's really slow but super accurate. And the one that's really accurate is actually cell cycle dependent. So that's something we're actually looking into. Does it matter where a double strand break occurs in the nucleus in terms of how it's repaired? But what is definitely known is it matters at what point in the cell cycle that double strand break occurs. So there's definitely a relationship between how important the gene is and the mode of repair. Um, and obviously the consequences, like if you have a double strand break occur in a really important part of the genome, that's, that's, that's more dangerous than in a part that doesn't matter. So that, that's a really good question and certainly something people are already um, trying to investigate. So there um, is another question. Are there any complications switching molecules light and dark for super resolution microscopy? So that's a great question from Rob. Um, there are, so with the, um, the method I mentioned where you turn on one molecule at a time, there are certain fluorophores that blink. So you can imagine if they're blinking, you might think, oh, that's a second molecule that's turned on. There must be more than one molecule at that location. And if it blinks a lot, 
it'll start to look like there's a cluster at that location when really it's just this one molecule blinking. So the, the photophysics of the fluorophores that you use in single molecule localization microscopy really matter because it can lead to artifacts where it looks like proteins are clustering at one location when actually there's just one molecule there and it's blinking on and off. So there's another question from Daryl. If humans have 98% non-coding DNA and axolotls have 10 times more DNA, does that mean that they have 99.8% non-coding DNA or do they have more genes? So that's also um, a good question. So interestingly, what's been found is that with genome size, once you get to a certain size, it doesn't matter how much bigger that genome gets. Um, in the case of uh, genomes that are big, there's usually around 22 to 30,000 genes. So if the genome is 40 times bigger than the human genome, they will still have around this 22 to 30,000 um, genes. And so then the question is, what is all that extra non-coding DNA for? And is all of it useful or what fraction of it's useful? Um, and that's something that's still not entirely understood. I mean, in the past, people thought it was all junk and that's definitely not the case. We know that now, but it's more a question of how much of it is, is functional and, and what exactly is it doing? So there's another question. Can we track epigenetic modifications using fluorescence? So that's, a, that's also something we're very interested in. So epigenetic modifications, you can't actually label them genetically encoded fluorescent proteins. You have to use um, what's called immunofluorescence. So you can highlight epigenetic marks, um, but you're limited to observing them in fixed cells. And so we do use that histone threat assay to MAC chromatin paction, and we can see where chromatin is open versus compact. And then we co-localize that with immunofluorescence that highlights, for example, H3K9 methylation, that is a repressive mark. Um, with other marks that are known with transcriptional activation. So you, you can label epigenetic modifications with fluorescent markers and, and look at them in an intact nucleus, but you're, you're limited to a fixed cell. So why genome size um, can't be used as a parameter to predict organism complexity? Um, so that's, that's like a, an outstanding question, uh, really. Um, so genome size, there's definitely a correlation, like uh, eukaryotes have bigger genomes than prokaryotes in general, but amongst eukaryotes, there doesn't seem to be a lot of correlation between genome size and complexity. But, what, but I actually, in making this lecture, what I wondered is how we even classify complexity because I mean, an axolotl might not appear as complex as a human, but at the end of the day, they can regrow limbs and do other amazing things. So I think it's clear that we're more complex potentially than a Paris Japonica plant, but um, I don't know how complexity is actually defined um, in a quantitative way, but it certainly hasn't so far been a good predictor of organism complexity. And I think that that was surprising at first, and what was even more surprising is that there's not a number of genes that scales with genome size. So that it does flatten out at around 20 to 30,000. Um, then there's a question of, will we be able to see the recorded video after the presentation? Um, I don't know the ads. Is that, we will be able to do that, Poppy? Uh, I suspect we should. I'm just not sure where they'll be housed but I've emailed faculty and hopefully we'll get a, a response to that as soon as possible. Okay cool. Um, so that might be possible um, and then what is the future? Uh, oh Natalie says yes you can. Uh, so that's that's that answer. What is the future looking for like for the research? Um, so in our lab what we're really keen to do and which I didn't talk about um, is the fact that so you talk about genome sequencing, saying it can only analyze linear DNA templates, but there's actually a whole bunch of quite um, novel approaches to genome sequencing that um, can, can identify DNA contacts, albeit outside of an intact nucleus, but it's commenting on chromosome organization, uh, the spatial topology of genome organization, and it's, it's really um, found a lot of structural features that weren't accessible um, in microscopy. Um, and it's, it's advantageous because it's high throughput. And, but the problem is 
a lot of the predictions about genome organization that have been made from these, um, what are called 3C, so chromatin confirmation capture genomic sequencing methods, haven't been verified in living cells. And it's likely because we're not looking at chromatin architecture on the right spatial scale. So we're trying to really um, make this histone FRET assay confirm some of these um, genomic sequencing uh, methods that are commenting on how um, different parts of the genome are organized to regulate gene expression. So that's definitely one aspect. And then another aspect, I guess, is um, trying to look at this in three dimensions. So currently we do a lot of our imaging in two dimensions, just one plane in the nucleus, but the, the nucleoplasm is actually like a quite a large volume. And so trying to use um, optical schemes that enable a light sheet illumination rather than a laser scanning uh, mechanism is, is another thing that we're interested in um, using the histone FRED assay with. And another thing we do that I didn't mention today is we use a lot of methods that track the diffusive route of the proteins that interact with the DNA telling plate and um, looking at how single molecule events um, lead to um, gene expression is another um, thing we're interested in. So rather than looking at chromatin organization from the point of view of the DNA, we look at how the proteins actually interact with that DNA network. So another question is how does the detail you achieve through FRET compare to cryo-EM microscopy and do you use these methods in a complementary way? Yeah, so cryo-EM is um, like more atomic level information. Um, FRET at a single molecule level can um, comment on details about uh, protein conformation at, in an in vitro setting, but certainly not in a living cell. And so I think there's definitely um, scope for, I think it's always important to, to look at things um, on multiple spatial scales. So uh, cryo-EM gives you unbelievable resolution on protein conformation outside of the cell, whilst um, FRET enables you to look at protein conformation on an ensemble level, so a more population level rather than a single single protein, but you have the advantage that it's in its natural environment and all the regulators of that protein are present. Um, and then another question is what inspired me to, um, to go into this field of science? Um, so actually, initially, I did my PhD on um, fluorescence spectroscopy uh, and how fluorescence of pigments and dyes used throughout the history of art can be used to identify a painting and authenticate it um, and, 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 and uh, like inform how you should illuminate it in a gallery. For example, fluorescent pigments need ultraviolet wavelengths in order to be fully luminous. And so this can impact um, an artist's intent. Um, but then after my PhD, um, I, I wasn't sure what to do and I went to a, a workshop um, looking at biological applications of fluorescence and I didn't had no idea that you could measure uh, fluorescence in a dynamic system like a living cell and so um, I met who did become my postdoctoral supervisor at a workshop in Armadale which is in the and then I just asked if I could join his lab after my PhD and and I um, I just really loved um, fluorescence microscopy at that point. 